Good Wednesday morning of the first week of Advent. This is a great reading from Isaiah. Let me read it. It's famous. You guys, everyone listening to me right now is, you don't need me. Just read the text and you're familiar with it. You already are. It says, on the mountain, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will provide for all peoples a feast of rich food and choice wines, juicy, rich food and pure choice wines. On this mountain he will destroy the veil that veils all peoples, the web that is woven over all nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. The reproach of his people he will remove from the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. On that day it will be said, Behold our God to whom we look to save us. This is the Lord for whom we looked. Let us rejoice and be glad that he has saved us. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. You know, when I read a text like that, you, when he talks about our, a feast of rich, rich food and choice wines, juicy, rich food and pure choice wines, on this day he will destroy the veil that veils all peoples. I have an immediate experience of that, whatever that may be worth you. You had to come to Christmas dinner at my home. I'm talking 65 years ago when I was in high school. Because all my uncles and aunts, not a lot of us, we weren't a big family, could all sit at one table, my cousins, maybe 25 of us, and some very, very special friends. Auntie B and Uncle John and others. Auntie B is you know, an honorary title. Aunt Sarah, she was no more my aunt than Man the Moon, but <laughs> she was on to us, you see. And before, before dinner, often the guests would come, Pete and Demi, our f fellow fishermen, they would come for a drink and hors d'oeuvres. My mother made the hors d'oeuvres. And my mother couldn't boil water, but she made very good hors d'oeuvres. My grandmother and my father were the cooks, the chefs, anyway. People came from, they came and visited from right after Mass on a Christmas day, from roughly 10 o'clock on. And about 1 o'clock, we sat down to dinner. And we sat there and ate until around 6 or 7 o'clock at night, straight through. And it's just what he's describing here. A feast of rich food and choice wines. You can remember the cooking that was going on. Juicy, rich food and pure choice wines. See? And on this mount, he'll destroy the veil that veils all peoples. There was no, there were no strangers at the table, even if it's a first time guest, a friend of ours, could be anybody. When you sat at the table, you were a friend among friends. There was no separation, no veil of darkness and no arguments. You are not allowed to argue, but you were you were invited to chat. You gotta say one time. Boy, I remember it vividly. We got into it. I don't remember the exact detail. But a discussion turned into an argument. My father brought it to a quick end. And that was really awkward. It was, I think, one of my uncles. You didn't do that at the table. You didn't argue at the table. Any more than you would argue at the Eucharist. The table was sacred. And there, we were actively friends among friends. While the discussions were real, they could not be adversarial. If you had a disagreement, even within your family, you, you uh, left your disagreements at the door and you could recover them after you left. But you didn't do it at the table. That's the truth. That's why when I read this text, I think my father could have written this. He could have written it because that's what Christmas dinner was like for us. It was a communion of friends and family, which there is no hostility. 
no anger, no argument. Just the love of the love of friendship and relationship. And it wasn't that we were all so how should we say innocent and with our own gripes and grudges. There were plenty, but not at that table. There were some we used to call it bad blood. There was, you know, some dislikes among the relatives that went rather deep and, st and they were significant. You'd never know it at that table. It was not allowed. And everyone knew it was not allowed. And it didn't occur. Boy, I don't know. My father knew how to be an extraordinarily good host. He made everyone comfortable at the table. Everyone was family and friends together. It's a verb, friends together. It's a verb. You act on it. Okay? Afterwards, you might have a little thing. Well, I guess then, you know, you'd hear that, whatever. But the kicker was at the table, it was a table that was actively peaceful and loving. You know, it's just what you got here in the, the mountain. On this mountain, he will destroy the veil that veils all people, the things that separate, the web that it wove, that is woven over all nations. He will destroy even death itself. I must admit, at that time, the word death wouldn't have meant as much to me as it does now because of the great separation that is death. We lose the ones we love. And we will eventually be gone. But as I told my kids in class with the hope that one day we will be alive together in paradise, I told you that so many times. I love that expression from my Anna Jan in Italy. We will see each other again in paradise. Boy, that's a powerful hope. When you're young, you, you don't think those, nor should you. You should be thinking about what you can make of this life, obviously. If you don't, you're going to turn out to be a loser in life. You have to have ambition for yourself and those you care about and to aggressively go after it. If not, you're going to lose. But at the same time, once you have done this and lived it, you recognize that it's not enough. There has to be more. And that death is the enemy and it has to be ultimately overcome. I love that expression from our Jenny, my honor, Jenny, with the Amon Paradiso. We will see each other again in paradise. We will love each other in paradise. No longer will be the fear of death or the diminishment of time, but only the time of eternity itself in which love triumphs over hate, life over death. That's Christmas to me. It's Christmas is a reminder that the divine is present in the healing Christ. And in the birth of Christ is the birth of hope. That the, that the eternal order of things will triumph over the finality of death, of creatureliness and death, so that we can hope to be together through love, a love that never ends, together in Christ and through Christ with each other, with each other. Somebody in the parish, I think it was in the parish, or else it was at school, I forget, I'm they said to me, when, when I thought of heaven, what do I think of? And I said, being with my family, my friends forever. And I think of our Jenny, my aunt. We'll see each other again in paradise. What a beautiful Christmas thought. It is Christmas with Easter. Birth, death, rebirth. We will see each other again in paradise. No more tears, no more sorrow. Only the glory of life and love itself. Isn't that neat? Christmas is a time of anticipation and hope that time will be consumed in eternity. And what is good and beautiful and true, what we are, will be forever in Christ. We will see each other again. But now, not in the temporal passage of time, but in the permanence of eternity.